Cindy, there's a question on the I'm, chat. Thank you. I just was looking away. Um, okay, so I'm being asked again the difference um, between choosing a designated pastor versus a permanent pastor. Um, and I think, you know, I'll, ju I'll just say again that the UCC gives us these different types of pastors to be called. And uh, we had a bit of a bumpy time, not to put too fine a point on it, um, having an interim minister and then having a permanent minister um, that didn't stay with us for very long. And I think a lot of us were shook up by that and not really knowing um, which way to go. And so when we decided to look for a minister, and I think this was also in conversation with Reverend Marsha, um, it was really felt to be best to have this relationship where we have somebody with us for a designated period of time and a designated purpose to focus us and lead us um, and have the opportunity if it does gel, click, we work well together, we move forward and call um, the designated pastor as the permanent pastor. But if for some reason, we don't gel or we don't feel like we're going in the right direction, then we have the joy of doing the search all over again <laughs> to find somebody else. Um, but that's why we decided to do the designated to look at reconciliation and revitalization, revitalization sorry, of the congregation um, and ultimately transformation of our church. Um, Okay, interesting. I, I don't recognize the email, but I'm getting a question. How are you viewing the focus and priorities of the three-year designated period? Where does reconciliation versus transformation versus social justice rank? Okay, so um, part of the way that, that I approach the work that I do with congregations is, is heavily informed by by uh, my training and work as a professional uh, coach. You know, and one of the things in coaching uh, that I bring to this work is that we create goals together, you know, and, and that's really, I mean, the, the priorities of the, of the designated term will be goals that we create together. I mean, they, they follow along the lines of what Cindy's talking about, this uh, reconciliation, revitalization, and transformation. But as we get started, we're going to be working with, uh, with Reverend Marsha, who's been working with you all uh, to, to create some concrete goals for this time so that we can also know when, when we've achieved them, right? Um, but uh, just to know that, that that creation isn't something that I do alone or that you do alone or that even Reverend Marsha does alone but that we do that uh, together so that they're, they're, they're meaningful goals that, that we're working towards. Uh, and reconciliation versus transformation versus social justice. So I would rather than ranking these three, I would rather hold them together. Uh, uh, now, I will, that being said, I'll say that, that reconciliation for me, feels uh, foundational, right? I mean, just you, you have to have a solid foundation, just like you have to have a solid foundation on the house before you build the house, else the structure of the house is going to be kind of uh, questionable. Uh, likewise, I think that there's a level of coming to terms with history that has to happen, or doesn't has to happen, but ought to happen first, right? So that there's a solid foundation of relationship uh, so that 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 we all kind of live in covenant and know what that means, uh, and and practice what that means. Uh, and 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 then transformation uh, is uh, is really the work that God's doing in us, right? And and who does God, who is God calling us to be? Who is God calling us to serve? Who is God calling us to become as the body of Christ in a local place? You know, and so. Um, Gregory of Nyssa, this uh, Greek, uh, uh, Greek father, early Greek father in the church, talks about how we're always going from glory to glory, you know, 
that 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 who we are now is glory, right? And that 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 there's constant steps of transformation from glory to glory. Uh, and and so as part of how I see the the work of the church, you know, I want to say that there is absolutely nothing wrong with you. Nothing wrong with you at all right now, you know, and there's always kind of work of transformation. There's always the work of the spirit uh, groaning in us for the creation that wants to be given birth. Uh, and uh, and so, so that's always kind of in the picture. And in social justice, rather than framing the social justice, I guess I would want to offer, um, uh, it just went out of my head. Oh, just right relationship, justice, right? I mean, if we're living in right relationship with each other, that is social justice. I mean, it's also part of living out the gospel. And uh, I mean, there was a question, I think, somewhere around the um, second interview about politics, right? And, and I was reminding the committee that, 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 that po political refers to our common life, right? And so, so this notion that the gospel you know, ought not be political you know, I understand if, if, if we're meaning political in the terms of, of kind of divisiveness, but if we talk about our common life, that, that the gospel is political. And it's also, by its kind of nature, uh, is oriented towards social justice, you know, because the entire Hebrew scripture into the Christian scripture, uh, especially placing the alien widow and orphan uh, at the center of our concern, uh, and, and so there's an element of social justice that's just part of being Christian. Uh, so I'm not sure if I really uh, answered the question, but that's how I would think about both the goals and those pieces of transformation, uh, social justice, and reconciliation. So I just want to say that I do realize that that came from Pam Knox, and I just, I'm sorry, I'm getting used to this format myself. I'm seeing questions in the chat from Jeannie DeCaza and wondering if she wants to unmute and ask them herself. It's okay, I can do it. Are you chickening out on me? I'm trying to get you video savvy here, Jeannie. <laughs> um, so um, Jeannie DeCaza is the current chair of the church council and wanted to know um, in your role as designated minister, um, what you see is your role in authority, um, what role do boards and committees play, and what role does the congregation play? Mm. Are you I'm reading your question again? Mm -hmm. I'm unmuted. There she oh, is. Oh, great. Yay. <laughs> so, um, so could you say a little bit more, Jeannie, about uh, what you mean by role in authority uh, as an administrator? Well, some people in our congregation feel that the minister is a servant of us. Some feel that the minister is the pastoral leader of the church and has authority. Um, I just like to get your take on what you feel is the role of a pastor, uh, the role of boards and committees. You say you want to work together and, and we're very excited about that. Um, I just like to know how you see different facets of the congregation. Okay, so um, so to, starting off with those two kind of roles uh, or images as uh, servant uh, on, on the one hand and spiritual leader on the other hand, uh, I would say yes to both of those. Um, that uh, um, I, I see my role is primarily as the, uh, the spiritual leader of the congregation the, the, the one to kind of inspire and to, uh, to help us draw attention to how God is speaking and how God is leading us uh, on the one hand. And on the other hand, uh, without, without getting too much into my sermon text for tomorrow, um, there's this beautiful image that Jesus talks about being the gate. Well, I, I understand the gate as kind of the thing that helps to, um, to, to focus our attention, right? and helps to give boundaries and, and, and direction to, to our work. Uh, and I think that there's, there's a part of that, that, is, that that's my role too, but it's not in a sense of telling people what to do. 
it's rather an empowering ministry, you know, and, and I wholeheartedly believe that all of the boards and the committees all share in ministry. I mean, we are about this together. I mean, there are times, of course, uh, that where, where leadership is, uh, is needed, um, you know, for, for many different reasons. I mean, I think that, that we're seeing on, on a national level right now and, and even on a global level, the importance of solid leadership. Uh, you know, and so to be able to to be a steady voice for uh, for the different boards, committees, you know, and and to help bringing people together to understand well, if we are all the body of Christ, what function does one committee play in that body? What function does another committee uh, play in that? And so also then part of my role as spiritual leader is to hold up the big picture, right, and to see well how are we. How is our ministry working together in order to advance God's kingdom, as your um, you know, covenant says? Okay. Um, I also had another one. How do you approach conflict resolution and bullying? So um, I don't believe that there's any place for bullying. Right? I mean, just put that down. Uh, conflict resolution, uh, you know, I, I, I believe that this starts in healthy communication, uh, which uh, is clear and direct, right? You know, and then I think that without knowing some of the work that, that Reverend Marsh has done with you, my sense is that this would dovetail um, her work with you. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, you know, to provide a space where folks can be heard um, you know, speaking from their own experience uh, in, in a way that's, that's respectful for themselves and for each other, recognizing once again, going back to that image of body of Christ, right? That, that we are all the body of Christ and that, that everything that we say, all of our actions have an impact on this body. And of course, by having an impact on this body has an impact on what this body can do. Uh, you know, and so, so as much as possible, wanting to, uh, to provide a space, number one, where voices can be heard uh, and, and truth can be spoken with love, uh, you know, and uh, in, you know, in a respectful way that, that, that uh, respects who we are and why we're here together. Great. Thanks. Welcome. Harris, I see your question. Did you want to ask it? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so one, thank you, um, Reverend Henry, and also to the search committee for uh, setting up the time and um, just the, the process in general. I'm, I'm super enthusiastic um, about your, uh, uh, the potential of you joining our community. Um, I'm, I'm really curious, in, when I read the, uh, the letter and, and listened to your video, you, you referenced this idea of content contemplative Christianity and you also the downtown uh, media, uh, meditation community. I just love to hear more about what that, that is and what the tenets of it are and what that might look like at Church in the Gardens. Sure. So when we talk about contemplative Christianity, I mean, contemplation really refers to the direct experience with God uh, and particularly the direct experience with God in prayer. Uh, you know, and so it's, it's a way of praying. It's a kind of an, an, an etern, internal way of being present to God, but it's also a way that allows us to recognize God's presence in the midst of everyday life. Um, you know, I was, there's a, a place that's near us by the ocean uh, where I was walking last week or two, uh, and there's a rock that's out in the water, but right before you get to the rock, there's this pool that was so fabulous. It was like all these different colors and the, the, the algae and whatever animals. And, and to be able to pause in that moment and to see God in that pool. Um, or uh, another example, when I was still living in the East Village, you know, walking across and, and seeing the quality of light uh, on uh, Second Avenue, just like stunned in beauty, in the awe of that moment, and, and appreciating that as a moment of connection with, with God, uh, in, in a moment where, like, I'm just in the, in the experience of, of God. Now, 
before I get to 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 insight meditation, we talk about how that impacts the work of or the the life in Church of the Gardens. You know that I think that worship at its best leads us to an experience of God, leads us to an experience of God together, and also then gives us these seeds as we go out that we can continue to be aware of how God is speaking and to continue to have this sensitivity to, uh, to, to, to what God looks like out in the world. Um, you know, and so the, the contemplative way of Christianity, I think, helps to nurture uh, the internal experience of God, as well as recognizing uh, God at work uh, outside of us and among us with each other. Uh, as far as the, uh, the downtown meditation community goes, you know, so that grew out of a time when I was uh, going to church regularly at Judson Memorial Church in uh, Washington Square, and I wasn't necessarily feeling uh, spiritually nourished. Um, I mean, nourished on one level of community, but that there was a deeper hunger that that I was aware of, uh, and so so I sought uh, out meditation. And it just happens that, you know, in the way that things just happen, uh, that, that I found this community that spoke in, in this, this tradition of, of meditation uh, that, that really spoke to, to, to me and especially to, uh, to Ignatian spirituality. I mean, I think that um, uh, Ignatius, uh, uh, I don't know how familiar you are, but uh, I think that Ignatius and, um, and the Buddha would have had a fabulous time talking over coffee um, because there's so many overlaps of, of uh, uh, Ignatian spirituality uh, and uh, in, um, insight meditation. You know, and so it was uh, a way of deepening uh, a meditation practice in community. You know, and I, and I think that, that for as much as technique that I learned um, in, in in those classes and in that community. I think that I also learned about just the value of practicing with other people. You know, before everybody got on the call, I was, I was sharing with the, with the uh, search committee uh, a story about this meditation group that I've been a part of over the last several weeks since we've been in, uh, in isolation that uh, has just nurtured my practice. You know, and I, and I feel like when we meditate together, um, this, there's this vibration that we get onto. Uh, and so I think how that's going to play out. One, I want to, I'm curious to know more about the meditation group that's already part of the life of Church of the Gardens. Um, uh, and, and also, I think that that could play out in a way of looking at small faith communities and uh, spiritual practice outside of Sunday worship. Um, but uh, I, I guess all in all, it's just really a, a sensitivity uh, to how God's spirit uh, might be moving within us and among us and in the world. All set, Harris. Thank, yeah, thanks for sharing. I appreciate it. You're welcome. I, I think I, I, I know I would benefit a lot from that, um, exploring that and going on that journey with you. So thank you. Cool. You're welcome. Deborah, I see your question. Yes. Hi. Good morning. Um, it's a pleasure to meet you too, and, and my thanks again to the search committee for all the hours that you put in to get us to this point. Um, uh, my question has to do with our current environment, and due to social distancing, I realized you probably won't be able to move here anytime soon, or be delayed at least. And I was wondering what your ideas were for how you're going to transition into the role of our minister in that environment. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, <laughs> I would love to say that I have a five-point plan, um, but I don't. Uh, you, you know, I think that, that a lot of this, there's the, the analogies, whether you want to use the analogy of building the plane as we fly it or building the bridge as we walk on it, <laughs> either one of those uh, would apply. Um, I mean, there, there are some advantages to, uh, to being in a virtual environment. Uh, and that is that, you know, I mean, it's, it's kind of easier to gather people together. You know, I mean, um, at, at least if we're mostly at home, uh, it seems to be uh, easier. 
But I mean, joining you for Sunday worship is uh, one way of beginning to get to know and work with you. Uh, also just calling and, and getting to know folks, uh, whether that's on the phone, uh, perhaps at times preferably on the phone, or over Zoom, a way that, that, that we can begin to, or at least I can begin to, to know your names uh, and, um, and, you know, in your stories, like, why are you, why are you here? What, what do you bring to this community? What do you want from this community? Uh, what do you think God is leading, you know, uh, in you and, and, and through, uh, through the congregation? You know, so some of those conversations, I think that absolutely can happen uh, in, the, uh, in the interim, uh, as well as uh, other boards and, and committees that, that, that are meeting. I mean, I think that there's uh, value in getting to know who, who, who people are and, and what the work is, uh, which in, in, in some way, considering I would, you know, would be starting in the beginning of the summer, um, you know, summers are typically for congregation or downtime anyway. Right. You know, and so, uh, so in in some ways, I'd kind of be doing something analogous to what I would be doing in the first few months anyway, even though um, uh, you know from virtual means. Um, and I'll add in that I mean, who knows when when I'll be able to uh, to to move. Uh, there have been times that, that I've thought that it's going to be a long time from now, and then there are times that I don't think it's going to be quite so long, um, you know, and Peter and I have, have uh, talked about the possibility of, of moving to our place upstate to, in the meantime, so, uh, <laughs> so at least we'd be closer um, and able to get in by train uh, much more easily than we can from Boston. Um, but. Ultimately, it's it's one step at a time and figuring out what really feels like the right the right the right course. Thank you. Do you mind if I just ask a follow up question to that? And of course. What 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 can we do as a congregation to uh, facilitate your transitioning into this role? Um, what you, you can do, I mean, is I want to I want to reach out to to folks and to, to set up conversations, you know, and, and to, to help in, in just having a conversation with me, you know, and, and telling them about who you are and, and you know, all these questions is talking about why you're here, all of that. Um, but being open to, to those conversations and also reminding me of your names over and over. <laughs> Uh, that's and, mutual and, <laughs> that'll be mutual until yeah. i get it yeah, yeah. Okay. thank you you're welcome janie to see what i wrote uh <laughs> okay what what do you and others say are your strengths and what are you proudest of in your ministry mm. i think what what I would recognize and what other people would recognize as one of my strengths is, uh, is just being steady, a steady presence, and especially in times of, of a lot of anxiety, um, which is lucky because we're in a time of, of high anxiety. Uh, and, and so I think that I bring a kind of a solidity, um, and a lot of that goes to, to my own practice, you know, I mean, Thank God for this chair for for my cushion where I'm sitting half an hour at least a day, uh, you know, and and just being steady, uh, and also like the the really deep spirituality, you know that uh, it, it's funny, you know I think that that people have an image of what a minister is, and in some ways I want to tell folks, yeah, I'm a minister, but I'm not that kind of minister. Uh, <laughs> And yet the kind that I am is, is deeply rooted in God, right? And, um, and so it's just, just what I bring. Uh, in terms of what I'm proudest of, you know, I think about uh, the collaborations and some of, the, uh, some of what, what I've been able to, to leave behind me. Um, you know, there is a, the two congregations ago that was in the middle of a building project and 
their uh, family ministries was just kind of all in shambles and and uh, and bringing together a task force to to address their building and to address their family ministries uh, that has uh, that has lived on since since I've been gone um, and uh, yeah and and getting people to think like in in just bigger ways. You know, I, I think that we limit, we limit our own power, we limit the power of God. Uh, and, and so to really help folks stretch, well, how is God actually wanting us to, 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 to make an impact on the world? You know, because the fact is that, that you know, as, as I was making reference to earlier, we're at a changing time in the church, right? And not every congregation is going to survive. You know, and, the, and those who do are the ones who are really embodying what their mission is, uh, you know. And so, so that's some of the work that I'm proudest of. There's, I'll tell you a story uh, quickly about a congregation in Western Massachusetts that, that I've been coaching through, uh, through a program offered through the UCC here and the Disciples of Christ called Churches Alive New Beginnings. Uh, well, through my work with them, this is like, this blah of a building in, in downtown Holyoke, which is nothing, nothing fancy, I promise you. Uh, and, you know, and yet what I realized, you know, that they have this place where they're actually the center of downtown, you know, and so through our conversation together, we start talking about art and start talking about how their building could be used as, as, uh, as a canvas for art and for transformation for the community. Uh, and lo and behold, that started, but that was only the beginning, right? And so, so now their building is covered with art, but they have uh, a bunch of different artists and, and other communities coming to them and working with them. Uh, and all of that just got started through our coaching together. Uh, and so I think that's really cool. Okay. Uh, that's a good answer. I, I, I just have one other thing, Cindy, I'm sorry to, Take uh, I have to read it. Uh, we all read your letter and your background, and it, it's very interesting and uh, exciting. Why did you choose to become a Roman Catholic priest if you were Episcopalian? And then why did you leave the priesthood and become a liberal Protestant UCC Judson Memorial Church? And then once ordained as a, as a Roman Catholic priest, are you not always considered part of that holy order? I'm, I'm not clear. I'm not, I don't know. But we okay. just, uh, just questions about that priesthood, Episcopal, priest, UCC. Yes. Okay. So I, I'll start answering. And if I'm like wandering away or if I'm not addressing something, uh, feel free to uh, okay. ask some follow-up questions. Okay. Um, so the, the answer starts about why Episcopal and the Roman Catholic. The answer actually starts in my family heritage, uh, in those, the two pieces of being um, of Cherokee on the one hand and Jewish on the other hand. And both of those like were known to be parts of who we were, but were really suppressed. And we didn't, I wasn't connected to either of those traditions even though they were both living in me, um, but I had no idea what it meant, right? And, and so if you can imagine uh, having access to some big, or having this big story and not having access to it, that's what it was like growing up, you know? And so we were Episcopalian and, you know, and I found that to be, you know, it was a, a wonderful tradition. It didn't really feel like home. Um, but it was what I was trained in. Uh, and then there was a point uh, in life when I went to college that, uh, that the Episcopal Church, and especially the Episcopal Church in Georgia, where we were living at the time, um, was embroiled in a fight over two things. Uh, one was the ordination of women. The other one was the inclusion of, of gay people in the life of the church. So not really being ready to deal with either of those issues, I thought, well, hey, I'll just go to the Roman Catholic Church, you know, uh, and, uh, and the part that I really loved about the Episcopal Church, as well as the Roman Catholic Church, was the liturgy, 
you know, I mean, that gets back to Harris's question about cont uh, contemplation and the direct experience uh, with God. Well, you know, little did I know that that going into the Catholic Church, I mean, I didn't even know my own kind of uh, sexual orientation at the time, um, you know, and I had no idea that, that I was leaving one set of, uh, of internal family issues to only to take on a whole other set of uh, internal family issues. Um, but it seems like a good idea at the time. Uh, and I, I really did appreciate the depth of Roman Catholicism and the depth of spirituality. I mean, I would say that, that, that it continues to shape uh, who I am both as a person and as a minister. You know, and especially as I was referring a few, few, few minutes ago about uh, Ignatian spirituality uh, that, that heavily identifies uh, who I am. Um, however, uh, as I was ordained a priest, uh, just before I was ordained a priest and right after, uh, the whole sexual abuse crisis hit. Crisis hit. And I'll say that um, for me as kind of burgeoning in my own understanding of who I was for four years, four out of the five years, the seminary was, um, was a place of nurturance, was a place of home, a place where I could really grow and understand and who I was and to begin to do some work in therapy and all of this stuff that was so good. And then the, the abuse crisis hit and everything changed overnight. You know, that, that, where there was a space for gay men to be, you know, just to, to work on the stuff that they were working on in spirituality. One day, the next day there wasn't. The next day, um, anybody who positively identified as gay was suspect of being a pederast um, and was, was the problem for the Catholic Church. And that was the environment in which I was ordained. Um, and, uh, and in fact, I was almost not ordained um, because uh, briefly before the ordination service itself, I was called in to talk to the bishop and the bishop um, said that he'd been hearing rumors that I was a practicing homosexual. Is this true? Like, oh, shit. Um, pardon me. Um, I, uh, and and so, so I served as a priest, but there was always this part of me that that was kind of just not settled because uh, because I was being asked not only to be I was being asked to represent an institution that would not recognize people like me. I was being asked to represent an institution who would deny people like me and my story, and still to this day, who will deny um, queer people, who will deny women, who will deny all kinds of folks of the right to tell their stories, and that's the thing that that. I just kind of woke up to, and I realized that I have a choice here. And the choice is to remain a priest and to be bitter, or to leave and not knowing what, what I was getting into, but to know that my integrity was worth more than the security of being a Roman Catholic priest. Um, and so actually when I left the priesthood, talk about not having a seven point plan, I didn't have a plan. I was just leaving. Um, and I didn't know that I was, would ever return to ministry. Um, and yet I wasn't away from ministry for very long, um, going to culinary school, uh, when I realized, I'm like, okay, this whole cooking thing, that's just, this is fun, but this isn't my work. You know, my work is, is, is about pastoring. My work is about companioning people through, uh, through really critical times of their lives. Um, and it just so happened that I, I found Judson because of uh, a friend of a former partner. Uh, memorial service was at Judson. Um, I was drawn in by the sign. I started going to worship there. Uh, and over the course of a few years, uh, started looking into the UCC as a denominational home. Uh, and so 
And the thing that, that I really appreciated about the, the UCC was that it was clear to me that I didn't have to leave my past behind. I didn't have to leave who I was as, as, as a Roman Catholic. I didn't have to leave who I was with this, this, this kind of rich cultural heritage. Um, I didn't, there, there, was no, there was no orthodoxy or anything that I had to be that, that really what the UCC was interested in was number one, did I know my theology? Could I express my theology? And then was I open to learning from others? Um, and, and so all of that uh, helped me to, to find this as a, as a congregational home. Uh, Thank you so much for sharing that difficult time. Um, I, see, I see a question and also a comment from John Herrick. Uh, yeah, so my question goes back to the uh, three years. Um, does anyone higher up in the UCC also get to make a decision on the uh, three years, or is it just us as a uh, congregation? Just y'all. Okay. Uh, I mean, I, you know, the UCC, there's this idea, there's this notion of covenant. Right. That is really strong, right? You know, so so you have covenant with each other. I would have covenant with you. We all have covenant with the wider church, you know. And so respecting covenant, uh, it's still there's uh, you know it's balancing autonomy with covenant. Uh, and so this piece is is more on the aut autonomy side than on the covenant side. Okay, and also thank you for being so uh, open and honest with us and sharing your very personal story with us. Appreciate You're it. You're welcome. Amen. Um, um, I think Hal Christensen's question is next. You still need to unmute, darling. Bottom right. left. All right. There. Okay. Go. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, very interesting. I, I reading the, your letter, and you made the comment that you, uh, I'll quote, that you have, that we have the resources and commitment to make a big difference right here in Forest Hills, in Queens, and in the world. And I mm -hmm. think the vision of that would uh, be, I ask that as being a member of the uh, World Service Committee, and certainly that is part of our mission, things we try to do for people in Queens and our neighborhood, and also uh, for other organizations uh, around the world. What do you feel, how important that is to church? What kind of a, what do you envision in a few years from now, say the end of the three years or 10 years from now, whatever, uh, would mm -hmm. our, our, how the community would view us and how we view ourselves in relationship to the world? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for that. I mean, uh, part of what, what I base it on how is the is the place right the placement where the congregation is uh, not only geographically but also where where Queens is in the world you know I mean there's such a unique place right that uh, where the world comes together uh, and, uh, and and affords us the opportunity to learn from each other uh, how I view the, the the church you know and I'm just going to go back to this really kind of fundamental image of the body of Christ. You know, there's, a, there's this phrase in Latin, uh, extra ecclesium nulla salus, outside of the church, there is no salvation. Um, and in, in a lot of places, that's seen as an exclusive way, saying that there's, there's, a, there's a, a, an inside club and an outside club, and if you're not part of the inside club, then, then, then sorry. Um, but I view it in a, in, in a completely different way. That, that the church, as the body of Christ, has the, the capacity and the obligation to be the presence of God, to be the presence of Christ uh, in the community in very small ways, but in those small ways to have a big impact. Um, now, what that's going to look like, boots on the ground, is really going to, is going to depend. I mean, it's, 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 your, it's your vision, it goes back to the goals, it goes back to what we covenant to do together. Um, just that where you are uh, in terms of space uh, is so well poised uh, to, to have an impact. And that's kind of what I was trying to get at. I'm still a little unclear in terms of the 
the impact. So there's no particular vision. Uh, I mean, I agree with you, but I'm, I'm not quite sure how, what kind of activities that might involve that you, you lead the church towards and so forth. Is it more that we're a beacon as opposed to activities that we do or? Well, I think it's a combination, you know? I mean, one of the things that, that I think that, you know, and to, to learn from, from these, from uh, this time of social isolation, uh, and and meeting like this, you know, the uh, potential for small faith communities, you know, and and how small faith communities can uh, can can touch the world around them, uh, and and so it's both presence, but it's also the direct action of the church. Um, now, part of that, I would need to 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 be uh, be present and and learn more about the organizations and what's going on and what the needs are of the surrounding community. Than I do right now, um, but uh, but I, I think that that it's both who we are as a worshiping body uh, in the midst of the community, and so the relationships and the way of of working with uh, with each other and, and folks outside of uh, outside of the congregation uh, for the community. Thank you, Curtis. I see your question. Has Reverend Henry answered it already, or you can pose again? I don't know if I'm hearing you. I can't hear you, Curtis. <laughs> Uh, have me ask the question. So basically, he typed in, um, "Can you speak to an achievement in a past ministry that you're proud of?" Oh, um, well, the, the the things I would point back to, well, Holyoke, the the, the coaching work that, that that I was talking about, um, the uh, the family ministries program in in Somerville. Uh, the reconception where I am currently in Stoneham uh, as the, the congregation is, is the, the meeting house for the town, which is as it was founded, um, but that, that the church had slipped into this sort of um, isolated organization that didn't have as much of a connection to the community and helping the church to reclaim who they are as, uh, as the meeting house of the town. Um, those are the things that, are, that immediately come to mind. Can you just speak a little bit more about that in terms of how um, the church became more part of the community and of the town? Mm -hmm. So part of that starts with uh, interviews. You know, uh, there's, I think it, I don't know if it was part of the, the search process. Uh, it's definitely part of the interim process and it's part of Churches Alive. Uh, is having interviews with uh, leaders uh, in the town, yes. you know, and talking about, you know, what does, what do you see is this, the, the church bringing? What would the community be missing if the church wasn't here? Um, you know, and, and to get an outside perspective, because I think sometimes from the inside, we're not as aware of, of, how, of how people view us, number one, of our importance to the community. I and mean, we can get kind of so embroiled in, uh, pardon me, turf wars and like, you know, what's going on inside of the, you know, inside of the walls or are we worshiping in the right way? All of that sort of stuff that um, is less important in a way, um, but get outside. And so that was one of the things that, you know, met with the, uh, with the town manager, with the state representatives uh, and, and also helping the leadership of the church have some, some of those conversations you know, to, to hear from the folks in the town of what the church meant uh, and, and then to step, you know, stepping into it. It's like, okay, so now that we know who our neighbor is, what's the need, what are the needs are here, what have we done historically and, and what are we doing now and how can we really kind of claim who we are? Interesting. I mean, I think we did that um as part of, was it New Beginnings? I need someone to remind me um, where we did go out to the community and interview them and ask, and, and that's probably a good thing to build on in the future. 
Yeah, this um, is Cindy Herendine. That was part yeah. of the transformation process yeah. okay. in developing our future story. Right, thank you, yep. thank you. Um, Yang, I see your question is next. Uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, well, it's a two-part question. Uh, first of all, welcome, uh, Reverend Schoenfeld. Um, thank you so very much for your sharing. You share with us your uh, uh, experience during your spiritual journey. I'm so thankful for that. Uh, I have two-part questions, but I, you may have answered already, <laughs> but uh, I, I will say it again. Would you share with us uh, some of your um, story you experienced during your previous ministry, um, what was uh, most fulfilling uh, spiritual you know, transformation uh, you know, endeavor? And second part is that uh, what was the one you uh, may regret that mm. looking back, you would have done differently? Yeah, yeah. So um, the, 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 the first question, I want to point to what's happening right now uh, in this congregation in Sonam. Um, so I've been there a little over two years. My, uh, my contract there was uh, up in, uh, in January. And, you know, I don't know if you, the, the, the culture of Boston and, and is not really one that's welcoming of outsiders. Uh, and <laughs> right, um, and in in small towns, especially. I mean, I don't think I think Boston is a big small town, um, but you know, in in the in the towns, outsiders are really just not welcome. Uh, you know, and and especially as somebody who's perceived perceived in Stoneham as a New Yorker, <laughs> we don't you know we don't have anything to offer to us. Well, you know, and. And so for most of two years, I have felt like there's, there's something in between actually being able to pastor this congregation as a whole. I mean, I would do the work of pastoring. I would you know, show up in the, in, in the times I would call. I would do the funerals. I would lead worship, all of that. But, but people didn't lean into me, didn't depend on me as their pastor. That's changed since COVID. Um, and... In, in a way, they have accepted my leadership and who I am with them as their pastor in the last two months or so, like they haven't in the last two years. Hmm. And that is so gratifying, you know? And I have to say that, that in, in a way, I mean, there's this odd uh, thing that I didn't really expect to have to deal with, that now it makes termina terminating that relationship before I can actually be present to them is hard. You know, in, in a way that I didn't expect, and, and even two months ago wouldn't have been so much the case. Um, nevertheless, I'm really proud of that work. Mm -hmm. uh, mistakes. Oh my goodness. Um, one of the, the mistakes that I made in Stoneham was in seeking out the strong people in the congregation and leaning, you know, depending on their kind of working with them. And there was one person and his wife in particular that I, that I kind of leaned into that relationship so much that even though I was picking up on some of the ideas that he was uh, kind of putting out, we got so far ahead of the congregation as, uh, as the conference minister here would say, we got so far ahead that we started looking like the enemy. Um, and inadvertently, I just, I, I tinkered with the system in a way that did not help. Uh, and, and I learned something about systems and working in systems by making that mistake, you know? And I mean, the way that they deal with conflict, perhaps the way that a lot of churches deal with conflict is, uh, is, is, by uh, emotional distancing, you know, if somebody doesn't like what's going on, they leave, um, you know, and uh, that's really hard. That's hard. Um, and, and that, that I, that I played into that dynamic um, was, was hard learning. Thank you. 
Awesome. Um, Jack Quinn's got a question, um, and I think I'm asking it because <laughs> um, he's on the phone. Uh, what is your strategy or are your strategies for growing the congregation, communicating with those outside of Forest Hills, um, that is evangelizing, spreading the message outside of the church? So uh, my strategy for growing the congregation uh, is not to have a strategy for growing the congregation. Um, is to really, I mean, to, to focus on spiritual growth here, right? That we are the body of Christ and to, 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 to focus on the experience of God in worship, to focus on, on, on the God's power, on God's purpose, on God's promise right here, you know? And, and, and to, so that, that there's a tangible sense of God at worship that there's a tangible sense of God when the congregation is together, when the church is churching, you know, uh, and, and not really to worry about that as a growth strategy because it's not necessarily a growth strategy and recognizing that building up the, com the, the congregation and really deepening into God's purpose and power of, for the congregation is a growth strategy. You know, people will be attracted to that. Um, but it's not the major focus, right? Uh, and, and I think that, that if we start to, to, to go down into the role of the road of building the church, uh, unfortunately that can put us in the place of, of kind of, uh, of scar a scarcity mindset of, you know, that we have to have this in order to be, and that's not the way that God works, right? Uh, I mean, God is a God of abundance, right? And we have what we have. And it's actually quite enough, you know, uh, in, in John's gospel and the feeding of the multitudes, um, you know, that uh, when Jesus says to the disciples, now go collect the, uh, the fragments. Well, the word that's translated as fragments can also be translated as abundance, right? And it's almost as, as Jesus is saying, okay, you had this small amount and it fed all of these people. And now look how much abundance is still left over you know and so to really focus on abundance and how what god is doing here um as as a strategy uh and uh in terms of reaching out uh outside of outside of queens i mean one of the is uh is is simply the the gift of social media and we were talking uh on the worship uh rehearsal yesterday about how, because of Zoom and, and the security uh, concerns lately, how it's become an in-house thing, you know, and, and really you don't have, you, you can't have any visitors, uh, you know, if, if it's really secure. Well, there are options, right? Uh, you know, there, there are options to, to, to put the feed on Facebook as uh, Rama and I were talking about. Uh, there are some other options uh, on, on social media uh, to, to let folks know what's, what's going on. But it's also through some of the, the relationship building, you know, uh, what the organizations are, the local organizations, um, but also the organizations that have national ties. I mean, I, uh, I have the, the, the good fortune of, with my coaching work, uh, being connected to folks in, in the, uh, in the wider church and the denomination in, uh, in training uh, organizations and, and the other coaching organizations that can help to draw attention, you know, and, and so, and also just to talk about, hey, what's going on here? Because uh, I firmly believe that it won't be long before we have some exciting stuff going on, right? And to be able to, uh, to, to put that out there and uh, so, so folks know what's going on. Uh, just a follow up from Jack, and I think you've sort of addressed it, but I, I just want to make sure that it's asked um, that he feels that our church is inward focused and feels that we need to grow outward. How do we reach the people who don't walk by? Hmm. Well, uh, yeah, I, I think, again, it's, it's really deepening into our own kind of spiritual understanding. So an analogy. I do, uh, I do some work with uh, couples getting ready for marriage. Uh, and I, I tell a lot of my couples when, when we meet for the first time, I said, you know, 
my motivation for this is actually quite simple. I only want to change the world. Uh, did anybody laugh? Nobody yes, laughed. Uh, I did. <laughs> uh, thank you, Cindy. Um, uh, but you know, and and I said, okay, so so I know that 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 sounds. Um, uh, um, mm, my word, the word just escaped me. Um, grandiose. Mm. I know that sounds grandiose. However, here's the thing. If we're doing our work well here, I'm going to we're going to help build you up in love and build a community of love amongst the two of you. And that community of love that you will build up amongst the two of you will touch everybody that you touch, and it will touch everybody that they touch, and it will touch everybody that they touch, and it will go out in concentric circles, and we will change the world by building you up in a community of love. So that's my answer for you, that we will change Forest Hills, that we will change Queens, we will change the world by building one another up, in the community of love. I think that's a valid point. And I just want to tag on to that about um, coming from Phil McGraw, that relationships are all about how the other person makes you feel. And if we are sharing love and making people feel love, that's a great thing to share and, and yeah. send around, particularly um, at this time in our lives. Um, Agnes, I see you have a question. Did you want to log? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, because, because even when we're, if we're not necessarily building one another up to recognize that, that the stuff that, that can happen in relationships is usually coming from a place of pain, right? And to recognize that it's pain that's behind bad behavior. It's not that somebody is just an SOB or like some psychotic, whatever, um, that, Maybe they are, um, but uh, it's coming from a place of pain. And so to be able to address the pain too, you know, and to bring God's healing in there so that we get back to the relationships that do build on it. Well, well, that's the thing about an SOB. They're that way because they haven't identified the pain. They, they yes. just, it isn't clear in their head and they don't know how to address it. And Absolutely. we're all there to help each other um, find yep. and cure pain. I think yep. so. Anyway, enough of me. But Agnes, I see um, you're asking a question. Did you want to ask it? Yes. Hi. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for coming to us and uh, showing interest in joining our church. I have a question for you. I would like to know what you have done in your past experience to inspire the youth and to join. I mean, to inspire the youth to join the church and to participate in church activities. So one of my colleagues has this great um, phrase. She talks about making worship um, irresistible. I mean, church is, for a lot of, especially youth, is entirely resistible, right? And we have a lot of competition. I mean, I don't know what, uh, what, uh, sports leagues are like in Queens, but at least here in Massachusetts, sports happen on Sunday morning. Brunch happens on Sunday morning. A lot of stuff happens on Sunday morning. And so it doesn't happen. I mean, you know, it has an impact on church. Now, granted, we're in this cultural context that, uh, that while the same percentage of people today as in 1960 report being, you know, having kind of some awareness of God and some kind of spiritual practice, uh, the attendance today versus 1960 is very different, right? Uh, and, and I think that's for a lot of great reasons and, and just a lot of reasons, um, you know, and so, so the, the thing with making church attractive towards youth is to make it irresistible, you know, and, and what is worship, what does irresistible worship look like? Well, I don't necessarily have all of the answers, but I certainly have some questions for folks, you know, to how can we make this, you know, what would church, what would an irresistible church look like for you? Um, and so that's one thing uh, that, that I want to say. And then the other thing, and it was actually before that, um, making church I can't remember the word that you use, Agnes, uh, um, attractive for, for, for young people, something like that, right? Uh, uh, in inspire. Inspiring. Yeah. Inspiring, right. So 
one of the, the, the first things is simply to know to to know people's names you know and to know what what they dream of right and to help them see how god is in that uh you know i mean if if we're not if we're not really bringing god into the picture then we're not being church right um so helping folks to to build a relationship with god uh helping them to 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 see that in worship in a way that is meaningful uh helping them to connect to what's important in their lives um you know what's important in their values what's important in their work what's important in their school what's important outside of church um and so to connect the dots i think in some ways is also one way of inspiring people that that what happens here is not an anomaly of their lives but that it is is uh, foundational, part and parcel of, of their lives. Thank you. Uh, Rob and Susanna Hoff have a question. I hope. <laughs> Can I be here? Am I audible? You are. Yeah. Oh my Lord, that means I have to be sensible. That's right. <laughs> uh oh, uh, Reverend Schoenfeld, uh, in going back to that concept of building the church in terms of our flock and so forth, a metaphor comes to my mind, and correct me if I'm wrong, when you think of the process of making rock candy, you have the vessel with the sugar water in it, and you have the string hanging down the middle. And I, without trying to interpret what you're saying, overly interpret it, but it seems to me that what you're saying is without that string hanging down the middle, you're not going to have those crystals forming on the string to produce the candy. In other words, it's very easy to big a builder, uh, to, to build a bigger and uh, bigger vessel with more and more sugar water. We can build three times our, our sanctuary and so forth. What we want to do, and I think you're saying, is that our string, and it is there, it is our heritage, our string has to be very much immersed in that sugar water. So those crystals begin to build from the inside out to the point where we're going to have to add a third tier balcony or perhaps, you know, form, you know, build out our church left and right in the front in the form of a cross. But we want to get bigger, not in terms of just more sugar water and numbers, but we want to get bigger because we're forced to be bulging at the seams is, is that a good metaphor um i, I it, it, absolutely you know and and what what came up rob as, as you were talking uh was the notion that your church was founded for a reason you know and it's not just with with the clever people who joined together to, to have a church uh, in four sales gardens came up with it's that god had a purpose in the founding of your church you know and and i think that the clue of what that string is today is in what that string was in, was it 1913? Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. To, you know, and so, so yes. Yes. Um, to, to build from the inside out, um, because you're right. I mean, you know, look, I was, um, the, the church where the committee on ministry meets here in the, in the Metro Boston Association, uh, have a new they have a new pastor who's been there a couple of months uh and at least the last uh community ministry meeting that we could actually go to physically i noticed that they had put up this big welcome banner that's uh you know out in the parking lot and i would say well that's 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 great but what about inside do people feel welcome inside you know and and if you start from the inside and work your way out then what you're building is actually so much more sustainable, right? Than trying to figure out what the gimmick is or what the hook is or how do you get somebody in? Well, you get them in, that's great, but you got to feed them. And this does start with no, sorry. Start with the people who are already there and feed the flock. We start with the body of Christ. Right. What's which, that? Is, which is not to preclude our work in the wider community in the world by any means i didn't mean to intend that at all yeah 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 our evangelistic uh uh landing places will flow from the strength of our crystals that are building on that core yes absolutely absolutely because i mean you think in some ways if if, if we are forming disciples 
a church. Well, then those disciples go out to all the places that y'all work, right? Those disciples go out to all the, com the, the community organizations that you're a part of. They go out to all of the, the, the web of relationships that you're all a part of, right? And if, if we're forming disciples, then disciples are touching in all of those places. And so evangelism is naturally going out to all of those different places if we do our work inside. Thank you so much. Welcome. Uh, John Herrick just threw a question out. I'm just, um, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and ask John, because I think, I think your point is well taken, um, that we're all having trouble remembering names at times and, and the importance of bringing name tags back to be able to know everybody by name. I mean, it, it's interesting here. You see people's names here. Um, but when we get back to being in physical church together, I think that's a really um, good suggestion, John. I'll just I'll just say that, particularly as we welcome <laughs> God I, welcome in, after our vote, <laughs> Reverend John. I'll, I'll endorse that. I'll like <laughs> okay. name tags, absolutely. And I would go one step further about pronouns. Uh, and I say <laughs> pronouns out of experience. I was sharing with uh, whoever it was. Uh, that the last con or the two congregations ago, First Church Somerville, uh, had three things that were really unusual about them. Number one, their average age of membership was in the mid 30s. Um, number two, they were about half of the congregation uh, identified as LGBTQ, and almost a third of the congregation identified as trans. Uh, and so that taught me a whole lot about gender binaries in pronouns. Uh, and so in order to be welcoming, uh, to have you know, this sense that, that, that we're all in this together of having our names and our pronouns so that, that folks who, who may not be gender binary can see a home for themselves uh, amongst us. I think that came up as we were preparing for worship and the version of the Bible that you offered for worship. Can you just right. remind me again? Uh, the version? Yeah. Is it? I'm inclusive. inclusive Bible. I don't know why that word wouldn't come, but yeah. <laughs> this this translation, it's not perfect, um, and it's great um, because uh, the, the 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 folks who worked on this uh, had uh, just some solid scholarship, uh, and the way that it's represented. Uh, a lot of the scripture in 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 a way that is both really relational uh, and uh, and they do a good job of of, uh, of having uh, an egalitarian uh, translation of the scriptures. My biggest complaint about the uh, inclusive Bible is that it does not exist in a digital form, which means that every time that I put in the mm -hmm. bulletin stuff from the inclusive Bible. I'm either dictating it or typing it out, and that's a pain in the took us. But um, <laughs> but if that's my biggest complaint with it, yeah. I'll live with it. Um, I wanted to follow up with a nuts and bolts question um, that we mm -hmm. asked you, um, but to have the congregation here. Um, what is your experience in supervising staff? If so, what were their duties? And describe the ups and downs of the supervisory experience. So uh, both in these last two congregations that, that I've served, I've had uh, staff that are you know under under my supervision in uh, one way or the other, uh, and the way that I like to to approach that, it, it's a lot like a coaching relationship, you know that that uh, we all have we have a job to do. That's that's the easy part, right? The, our job and 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 what are the things that we're addressing? What are the things that we're not addressing? Uh, and uh, and how can how can we work towards that? Um, but also there's a there's a collegiality because you know I I, uh, I I feel like when when teams work together that that we all accomplish more than we can accomplish uh, uh, alone. Uh, and and so to try to help build a team, uh, help people articulate why they're there again, what they bring to the team, uh, what they need from the team. Um, are all really important things. Uh, and the most challenging part of that for me uh, has, has been to confront people when they're not. Uh, you know, I, I had a, a music minister that I worked with a few congregations ago 
who was really, really talented uh, and, and got music ministry in a way that I think very few folks who operate in that position um, get. And yet he was famous for getting in, in his own way and doing stuff that would sabotage all of, the, of his good work. You know, and so, uh, so it was my job to hold that up for him and say, so this is, this is what I'm seeing. Um, and, you know, these, this, this is what we're working towards. Number one, like, what's, what's, what's going on here? Uh, and what, uh, you know, what are the steps that we need to put into place in order to get to, uh, to the level of expectation? Uh, so uh, I, I, I don't necessarily, I don't enjoy being the bad cop. <laughs> yeah, I don't enjoy holding people accountable. Um, uh, and a lot of that goes back to all sorts of, <laughs> all sorts of internal dynamics. Um, but that's, so that's, that's a hard, been the hard part of uh, supervising staff is, is just holding folks accountable. So there's a question um, from Pam Knox, and I don't know if we really have the answer yet because we're all up in the air. I think right now we're having the candidating weekend and should you be called by our congregation um, as designated minister initially, are you gonna be working with us full or part-time? Well, uh, eventually, uh, I mean, I think it's, I, I really think that the work is full-time uh, no matter what. Uh, honestly, my experience in, in digital ministry in Stoneham, uh, which has far fewer members than your church does, uh, has been that it's been, I've been working more in the last uh, month or two than I was before. Um, I mean, part of it is just setting up uh, infrastructures, ways that, that I do work. Um, putting together material that that's being published in, in a different way and all of that. Um, and then of course I have, you know, a hundred and so folks to, to learn, to, to, to get to know. Uh, so all of that's going to take some time. Uh, so that would be my contention. Um, but I'm also, or I should say, and I'm also open to having that as a as an open conversation that we discover together. Um, I'm going to jump back for a second about the question about supervising and not being comfortable in, in the role of being bad cop. Um, and, and just mention to the congregation that's on here about our covenant. And there's some language in there about how we're called. Um, to walk together in brotherly, sisterly love and nurture each, other, nurture each other in faith. And some of that sometimes is even calling people on behavior that may not be um, Christian. And it's not easy to do, but we're called to do it. Um, and we need to support each other in the bad times as, as well as the good times. And I believe it will only make us stronger. Um, and I think that's a little of what we have to work out as a congregation in terms of the reconciliation. You know, and it reminds me of a conversation that I had with one of the deacons uh, in, in my present context. That was a hard conversation because, because after, uh, after church coming in through the receiving line, um, she said to me, near quote, uh, thanks for the sermon. I hope you practice what you preach. Mm. And I said, okay, Denise, you know, uh, Denise, that's actually not her name. Good thing. Um, <laughs> Just as well. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Uh, that's not okay. Hmm. That language is not okay. Right. Um, you know, we can have conversations about anything uh, in a respectful manner. Um, and that doesn't happen in a receiving line. And it doesn't happen with the barb. Right. A little more compassion everywhere. Um, Another question that's kind of pertinent to these times, how do you convey hope and self-care to stressed community members? And tell us about your pastoral care and counseling in today's day and age. Mm. How do I express hope? Well, that's as, that, I don't say as easy. 
that's rooted in uh, in in prayer, uh, in my own spiritual life, uh, uh, and in my encounter with God. I mean, I actually think that that these are profoundly hopeful days, uh, even for for as many challenges and. and I could, I could get down, lost in the rabbit hole of, of everything that's wrong and everything that's challenging, and um, and at the same time, I think that uh, that that times such as these offer us an opportunity uh, to to look at what's really important, um, to to look at why we're really here, uh, what the legacy is that that we want to live, lead, live, Ugh. leave. Um, <laughs> You know, and, and all of that, I think, is that there's that there's a message of hope. I mean, the resurrection of, of all things, you know, and one of the central mysteries of our faith is that somehow God brings new life out of death. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's not just afterlife, that's during life. You know, that the, for every death that we experience, the power of God is bigger and God brings new life. You know, and so to continually remind us to look for where there's new life. You know, uh, is I think one way of of uh, of inspiring hope, even in such stressful and, and uh, uncertain times as the ones that we're living in now. Uh, it feels like there was another part of that question that I didn't get to. Um, pastoral care, providing pastoral care um, in this new world, basically a video so, and yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, a lot of it is 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 reaching out and being available, uh, holding holding the space for for folks to to be able to connect with me. I mean, uh, I've been doing having Zoom office hours for the congregation, uh, and so you know, folks know how to to reach me, but also to have have my finger on the pulse of the church. You know, and in and at least talking to the folks who know the people who who might need care. And and either you're know, reaching out myself or uh, or making sure that that others do, you know, especially given the all of the uh, all the, the the relationships uh, here in, in in Stoneham that that sometimes it's more effective to to have peers talking to peers, uh, but to make sure that that's happening, uh, you know, and and so. I mean, I actually find that 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 phone works really well for pastoral care, and and even Zoom. I mean, uh, I I have I have a love hate relationship with this technology, um, partially because my eyes get tired after a little while. I have to remember to to look up from the screen and you know not to to focus on on uh, on this virtual reality so much, um, but. Uh, um, uh, it also offers uh, an opportunity for, for, for pastoral care and connecting. Uh, you know, I bring to mind some of the uh, spiritual direction work that, that I've been doing. Um, and actually, I'm really quite glad that, that most of my directees, well, now all of my directees are, are online. You know, and so what I get to see through that is, is the power of, of this technology to really translate what's what's most important in people's lives, so um, so without diminishing personal contact and in and, and visitations and being able to actually be physically present in somebody's hospital room, for example, uh, I, I still think that that this technology, while not being perfect, is pretty good. Thank you. Um... I will note for everybody on the call and you, I'm sure are well aware that we've been meeting for an hour and a half. It's been a significant chunk of time. Um, It's been really helpful, I think, for the congregation to get to know you. Um, I feel remiss a bit because I realized that if we had done this in person, we probably would have had Peter with us too. Um, Mm. and And we didn't invite him to this. And I feel bad that we didn't do that. Well, um, I mean, he's he's in the other room. I don't. Want, <laughs> I don't want to put him on the spot. I don't yeah. want to put him on the spot. I think. I think maybe you know, if we get together for worship tomorrow, maybe at the end, just a quick. No, hug. he's. Oh he's, no. He's uh, working because. Oh. Um, yeah. His. Oh, thank his goodness. 
<laughs> absolutely. Right. Um, absolutely. But yeah, unfortunately, tomorrow he's not going to be around. But uh, I mean, I could see if he's. Why, why don't you? I, I feel yeah. really bad that we didn't think of this before. How about an impromptu harpsichord? <laughs> yeah, sure. Right, Simon. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Hold on. I make no promises, but I'll be back. I understand. Thank you. <laughs> we can do a happy hour. <laughs> Cindy, do you want to ask that question? I know Inga signed off, but she did have a question about the house. She, she, she did, and I, ans I answered her privately and basically oh. said it was the trustee's decision, that that's not a search committee decision, right? Well, I think that right now the, the plan is that it would not be available, that it would be um, because that's a significant um, income stream for the church right now with the rentals. And we don't anticipate that changing is the need for that right right now. So that we would proceed with the, a housing allowance. Yep. And that's based on uh, the recommendations from UCC too. Uh -oh. So I need to turn off the Bluetooth so that the, we don't have <laughs> audio. All right, you can still hear me okay, yes? Mm -hmm. So folks, this is Peter. <laughs> Announcing Peter. Hi, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> the Zoom wave. Yes. Wave. <laughs> I, mean, I was just saying I felt really bad to not invite you. Um, I can't hear you. Oh, no. Okay, there. Computer audio, you have us? Got it. I was just saying, you know, if, if this were in person, you definitely be, would be part of the meet and greet. And I was really remiss in not inviting you because I think the congregation should meet you too. You guys are a team, right? So. Well, we're, we're a team, <laughs> but we're never in the same place on Sunday morning. <laughs> well, it's Saturday, so we're happy we grabbed. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So is there anything that you want to share about your husband that we should know before we make a decision? Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> He's not going to say anything, Henry. Go ahead if you want. I don't mean to put you on the spot. Do they know where I work and what I do? Yeah, yeah. Do you know about First Church? No. Okay. So I'm a church organist, as along with everything else. Um, I've been playing at First Church in right. Cambridge, the UCC Church in Harvard Square, this October for 35 years. Um, it's been a, a home for us. This is where we were married. Um, it's a it's a wonderful church. Um, I probably will be going to playing there every other week um, once we move to New York together. That's still in progress, um, but we've been doing a virtual church. You can uh, actually, if you want, you can check out our services at www.firstchurchcambridge.org. Um, there's a whole list of archived services. They were starting to be live streamed even before all of this happened, and we just continued it um, so that uh, we're practicing social distancing by, because the organ is a long, long way from where the clergy are, um, but we're doing our services straight from the uh, sanctuary. And uh, this Sunday, as a matter of fact, um, there'll be uh, uh, the, one of the clergy will be singing a piece that I wrote just for the occasion. Um, because they wanted a particular text and I couldn't find a setting that I liked. And so I went ahead and just wrote something. Um, okay. Yeah. Is that good enough? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm about to do what you're doing right now. Um, I'm going to be giving a workshop for the San Francisco Early Music Society um, about uh, using the harpsichord, practicing the harpsichord uh, with other people, which of course we can't do now. So what can you do in order to pre prepare for being able to play ensemble music again? And so my workshop is entitled, The Sound of One Hand Clapping. Um, it's what we're going to do in order to try and uh, get ready for that day when we can get back together to play music. It sounds wonderful. We yes. are all I was just tuning the harpsichord. Henry just came and said, are you doing, doing anything you can't, get, uh, can't stop for a minute? I said, no, <laughs> not at all. I can, I can stop tuning the harpsichord for a second. <laughs> well, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much. I heard a lot of laughing coming from the other side of the door, so yeah. that makes me happy. Absolutely. Us too. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to check. Bye for now. 
Um, oh yeah, Sonny was on saying, how about an impromptu recital, harpsichord recital, but <laughs> he's just joking. As yes. with, um, I'm not seeing any more questions. I'll just float it out there. Is there anything that we may have missed that needs to be asked? I think it's been pretty comprehensive in my mind's eye. And I'm glad that people had the chance to participate. Ah, one of our members is asking, do you have any questions for us as a congregation? Oh. <laughs> I guess my deepest question is how ready are you as a congregation to listen to God's call and to step into what God's spirit is empowering and leading you all to be? I'm certainly not the person to answer for the congregation. Um, I, I will say though, um, and I'll have the search committee back me up in putting together the church profile, it feels that the congregation is ready to listen to God and to hear um, how we can be the arms, the hands, the feet, the mouths of the Holy Spirit um, throughout the congregation, the community, and the world. It's, it's, it's a challenging journey um, but I think we've grown in the past couple of years together um, and are looking to take on a challenge and support one another with some spiritual guidance. That's great. I mean, and, if and if I answered incorrectly, please somebody raise their hand. <laughs> and I need to, uh, yep. Um, I think uh, we're, oh wait, the Hoffs have raised their hand. Rob and Susanna? Hi, I, did I unmute? You did. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Hello, Reverend. Uh, I was excited in listening to your, um, your YouTube uh, production presentation yesterday. Yes. Because I felt you brought so much um, you, you specifically mentioned uh, how excited you were about Queens and living in Queens and uh, representing uh, the Lord that we worship here in Queens. Uh, today, you said that you think that the world is changing in so many ways, particularly with this pandemic, and you see it as an opportunity. And this is something we could talk about. We might not have time talk about but I look forward to talking to you about that cool yeah I would say um, just just about Queens really briefly so now I lived in Brooklyn when I first moved to New York I lived in Manhattan and a couple of different places uh, and this is not gratuitous at all for you all um, because the the fact is that through all of my time in New York Queens was my favorite borough um, because of the diversity of Queens, uh, because of the food that's in Queens, because of like the world that's in Queens that is n not even in Manhattan, right? Um, it's just such a rich place. And, uh, you know, uh, riding the seven train and hearing all the different languages, I love when I end up on a subway car and I'm the, per I, I'm the person with, the, with the, uh, the, the least pigment in their skin and I'm like, oh, thank God that there's a whole world of diversity around me and, and it just, it brings me such joy in life. Uh, and so I, I, I'm thrilled that, uh, uh, I mean, I'm thrilled to, to be going back to New York. Um, and, but I'm even more thrilled uh, that it's in Queens. Me, this is, uh, in, many people talk about Forest Hills Gardens as a bubble. And as a church, we need to reach out beyond that bubble. And uh, I think that that's an exciting task under the leadership of someone who um, can draw us into our proper place mm. in the city. 
Well, and, and one of the things that I understand uh, about that bubble is that um, that though this is where the church sits, that your the congregation isn't just in that bubble, right? Mm -hmm. And so therein lies the opportunity to connect the dots uh, between the world outside and the world inside. Uh, You'll be surprised how diverse Forest Hills is. <laughs> I'm sure. Positively. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, and Janie, 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 you raised your hand. Are you unmuting? Uh, just a search question. What is going to happen tomorrow? Um, I know that Reverend Henry is going to preach and then we meet. What is the purpose of our meeting after church tomorrow? I think it's basically having the congregational meeting for the vote um, to have some time together um, after Reverend Henry has left for the congregation to ask questions, maybe people who aren't here today um, oh, who may have just oh. caught up with the YouTube, YouTube yeah, video or this recording um, to ask questions and, and we can field them and then that's pretty much it and then people will vote and hopefully postmark their vote by the 6th of May. That's what I was concerned about. It says that we, you just said you we're going to vote on what tomorrow, and then what do we send our ballot in for? We're voting twice? No, no, we're not voting in person. We're voting by ballot only. Right, but you said- It's just to have the conversation. Uh, yeah, you just, that you just said tomorrow after church, we will, the congregation will vote. I don't- on what will we vote the tomorrow? Congregation will have a congregational meeting to discuss the vote. And then after that meeting, if there's any questions, concerns, okay. whatever, we okay. can discuss them as a congregation. And then people will vote on paper and mail it into the office. Okay. Thanks, sorry, confused. No, it's okay. I just, you know, trying to be as clear as possible. I'm just making, uh, Sure, that I think I think we've covered everything, and I think everyone is uh, asking for a closing prayer from Reverend Henry. <laughs> All right. So, let me close the chat box, and let's just let's be with each other in the spirit of prayer. Loving and faithful God. You have drawn us together. You have drawn us together in this moment, in this time, in this place. And though we cannot be present together in body, your spirit has drawn us together in our spirits. And God, I give you thanks for this gathering for those who could be present, and I give thanks to those who are gathered in spirit. I ask that you give us the gift of wisdom, that you give us the gift of discernment, that we may hear into each other, into the mission that you call us, that we make sense into the confirmation of your spirit to enter into covenant with each other. God, I ask that you bless us as we go about the rest of our day, that you allow us to enjoy this beautiful weather, even for all of the social restrictions that remain, but that we may see the bounty of your life in the sun in the warmth, and in our fellowship. Give you thanks for this time and for all, that, for all that you give to us. For we pray in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, and we look forward to worshiping with you tomorrow. Sounds great. Y'all have a good day. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you. Thank you.